So I'm going to head back here. Um, the first thing I'll do is actually I'm going to stop the API, and we can do that with Control C. And I'm going to minimize this. And we're just going to go ahead and delete that weather forecast object. That's going to prevent our controller from uh, being able to compile, but that's OK. I'm going to make the get request return an action result. And before we do anything here, I'm just going to return an OK response. Okay, so now our route is not really going to be doing anything. One thing that I am going to do is I'm going to remove this controller route. I'm going to specify the routes explicitly on each method. I just think that's a little bit easier to read when you are working on the application, uh, particularly if you're working with others and they're just trying to get familiar with what each method is doing. Let's rename our weather forecast controller like books controller. And we're still going to extend this controller base. This controller base class is provided by the framework. And I'm going to um, duck into the actual um, decompiled source of it very quickly. Just to show you that it contains um, quite a bit on it that is going to be pretty useful for us. So um, when we're talking about controllers, we are thinking about handling HTTP requests and responses, making responses and sending them back to the client. And so um, what this controller base does is really gives us access to um, things that will be common across all controllers and that will be useful across that entire context. So we'll have an HTTP context. So we have access to um, the request and the response. We'll have access to route data. We have access to the underlying sort of model binding validation. Um, we can check whether or not the model state of the request being received is valid. And so in general, this is just a really useful um, base class to have, and it will be what we're using out of the box with .NET Core uh, when we build a web API. Next, when we have our logger here, the type we need to provide will be the type that we're currently using. So we'll need a books, a books controller logger, and we'll need to update our constructor here as well. And we'll request a books controller logger, and then we'll set that backing field. We'll look at the dependency injection in a few minutes here. So we have our books controller extending controller base. We have a logger as a backing field, and we have a simple constructor here. And then we have a get method, which is currently just going to return OK. I'm going to clean up my usings. And then what I'm going to do is just run .NET build again. We'll make sure that everything's building. And we'll run .NET run. And we're getting an error here. So you'll notice that it's going to say something about our get route. So it's saying that um, the action uh, goodbooks web controllers book controller dot get does not have an attribute route. So action methods on controllers annotated with API controller attribute must be attribute routed. So what this is saying is, hey, you removed the route for this controller um, at the class level. So you need to tell me where this get method, uh, where you know what route should we map this method to. And so I'm going to take this format, which is a little bit more customary, um, and we're going to just add slash API slash books on localhost 5000 or 5001 execute this get method. And just to be more clear, we could name this uh, method whatever we like. So I'm going to name it get books. And maybe inside of the OK response here, we can just pass a string that says books just to kind of test it out. So I'm going to .NET build again, and then we'll .NET run. OK, so everything is running once again. If we head back into our browser, and this time if I go to slash API slash books. OK, so while that's interesting, we still don't really have any uh, behavior that we'd like. But we have introduced a new route that, we, that we'd that we like to use for books. And we've confirmed that we can edit the uh, the route to return some type of response for us. So now let's think about um, how we might get some books into the system and how we want to represent books. So the whole idea with the app here is that we can um, log books that we have read with a rating and um, some type of uh, summary or book review. 
So let's go back into our application layer and well, first of all, let's stop the server so we can control C. I'm going to rename the controller file as well here. And then we're going to take a closer look at our startup.cs file. In fact, I'm going to close my other tabs here and let's just talk for a minute about what's happening in here. And we'll talk about how we can actually set up a Postgres database to interact with our web API. So we have this startup class. This is a really important class in terms of, well, setting up our web API so that it has all of the sort of configuration that we need for our particular uh, context. And so you can see that the startup method has a constructor here that takes some configuration object. There is a public getter for that object. And then there are helpful comments here which say that, hey, this configure services method, it gets called by the runtime and use this method to add services to the container. And then we have another method here, configure, which says use this method to configure the HTTP request pipeline. So when we talk about an HTTP request pipeline, you'll often hear people talk about um, HTTP middleware. And so that's because as an HTTP request sort of goes through our system, if you will, there are a number of different things that can happen to that request. Um, the request gets routed, um, we might check headers for things like authorization, um, we might need to modify um, the HTTP request in some way, we might need to do things like configure cores or crossed origin um, requests, we might need to redirect the request for some reason, so there's all sorts of things um, in general that we might want to do when, when it comes to this middleware. So this will become important in a little while, but first let's talk about these services. So I mentioned dependency injection earlier, and um, there's, a, there's a pretty nice dependency injection framework that's built into .NET Core. And what we can do is um, when we build services, we can tell the framework that, hey, when I request a particular interface for a service, I need you to inject this particular instance that I've created. And so this is one of those things that I think will become uh, much clearer when we actually start building something out. So let's go ahead and do just that. We have this services class library. And so it came, um, the framework sort of scaffolded out an empty class called class one. What I'm gonna do here is rename class one to book service. And when we build service classes, we're always going to be programming to an interface. And so what does that mean? That means that uh, when we make book service, it's going to implement an interface. We'll call it iBookService. And all book services is a one particular implementation of the behavior that's defined by the interface iBookService. So let's go ahead and make that interface. Conventionally, I prefix uh, my interfaces with I, so we'll call it iBookService in this case. This might be, you know, Amazon Book Service or Google Book Service or um, what have you, some particular implementation of an interface. And an interface is where we define the behavior of a class. And so let's say that our iBookService needs to be able to add a book, for instance. And how is it going to add a book? Well, maybe it takes some book um, data model. And let's just name that a book. Maybe it needs the ability to delete a book. And maybe we can delete a book just by using some book ID. Maybe we want the ability to get all books, and so we want to return some list of book. For this, we'll need to implement um, or import uh, system collections, and we could call this method get all books. And finally, maybe we have a method to get a particular book just by its ID, so we'll call it get book and that'll take an integer book ID.
Okay, so we've defined some basic behavior for a service. We don't have a model for it yet. And so where do you think we should define that? Well, we have this data um, class library that I've created. And so what we'll do there is define our data model. So our services will have a dependency on the data models here. And we'll take a look at how to set that up in a moment here. But at the very least, let's go ahead and get our data class library structured so that we can create this book model. So in here, I'm going to create a new subdirectory. I'm going to call it data models. Um, maybe a bit redundant. Let's call it models. And then in this directory, we're going to create a new class called book. So we've got this public class book, and this will be what you'll often hear referred to as a POCO or plain old C sharp object class. This class doesn't really have behavior. It's more of a sort of it's sort of like a DTO, um, but specifically it's going to be mapped um, as an entity model to some table in our database. And for that, we're going to be using an ORM called Entity Framework Core. Um, and if you're not familiar with what an ORM does, it's essentially just a tool to map data um, from two different sort of technological contexts. In this case, Entity Framework is mapping um, C sharp objects, which are, um, you know, they're C sharp objects, and it's mapping those to SQL tables. And so that's a completely different sort of technological context. Um, but nonetheless, we can conceive of books as tables, which have columns for their various properties, and rows for each individual instance of a book. Whereas in software, in the c -sharp world, um, in object-oriented programming, we might think of books as objects which are defined by classes, and, which have properties instead of, you know, columns. And individual instances of books are instances of those objects. So what we'll do is we'll define the properties that make something a book here. And so this class will just contain these auto properties, um, which are also referred to as accessors and mutators, basically just a way to get and set um, these properties on this class. So there's our book. Um, it has an ID, a title, and maybe an author. I'm going to keep this really simple just so that um, we can more or less get the idea of what's happening here. It doesn't have to be too complex to illustrate uh, the general idea. I'm going to remove this class one sample, and then um, let's make a book review class as well. And so this book review class will have an ID, and then maybe we'll have a review author here. And then we'll have some text or a string for the actual review itself. And maybe we'll call that review content. The other thing that I like to do in general on most of my entities, um, I should say pretty much all of the entities, is um, create this created on property and updated on property. Why would we do this? Well, it just so happens that there is almost certainly always some business logic that is associated with um, or needs to have some awareness of when a particular object was or instance was um, created or updated on. That lets us do things like sort by uh, the newest book or the newest book review or get the, uh, the book review with the, with the latest updated on. Uh, value. So anything related to sort of sorting um, by some temporal dimension, then these created on and updated on values become very useful. So we've defined a book and a book review. You could make a much more complex system here, of course, where authors are um, represented as their own classes. Um, books could have many more properties on them, as could book reviews, um, but we'll save that for a, a later exercise. This is, again, just to kind of illustrate how to get um, an API like this hooked up. Again, this example is going to be relatively simple.